Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a podcast where we discuss all things John Carpenter all the time, from the resurrection of Bronco Billy to the ward. I am one of your hosts, Alex Adrock, and joining me is Noel. How are you doing, Noel? Hello. I am sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thankfully, it's not because I saw a rare lost print of a film that will kill everyone. Are you sure? I... He's not sure. I don't know, Melissa. You show us some weird movies sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. I do. But I think the last time I did that was Haozu. And last time yeah. I checked, Haozu did not quite produce that sort of result. There's still a whimsy to Haozu. Yeah. There is. There is. Elation for me. Oh, poor Kung Fu. <laughs> And who is this voice? Why, that's Melissa Kirscher. Melissa, hello, and welcome back to the podcast. Hello, and thank you. It's good to be back. Oh, I'm so excited. I like this one a lot. I am Melissa Kirscher. I'm a podcaster at Xanadu Cinema Pleasure Dome and at A Real Education and at A Real Education Noir. And I also am a big movie nerd, as you might be able to tell from my podcasts. <laughs> I've seen her house. It's true. Oh, yes. Mahauzu. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, that was a dumb joke. <laughs> so anyway, hi, it's good to be back. It's good to have you here. This is the start of a two-part look at the Masters of Horror television series, specifically the two episodes that were directed by John Carpenter. Have either of you ever watched the Masters of Horror series before? I always meant to. I always saw it at video stores, and I always meant to watch it. So that's why it was so shocking when I did watch it, and I'm like, oh, flip phone. So uh, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> Hey, Melissa? I have a special story. You should answer that question yourself, Noel, and I will top it with my story. How's that? Funnily enough, I've only ever seen two episodes of Masters of Horror, just for random reasons, because I was doing something involved in the creators. Like, when I was going through all of Koji Suzuki, I watched Dream Cruise, which was awful. Yeah. And by random happenstance, I watched Cigarette Burns. Mid-2000s, I had kind of wandered away from Carpenter for a while, but I heard a lot of buzz about Cigarette Burns. I wanted to make sure I watched it. But otherwise, I haven't watched any other episodes. Strangely, though, I've watched most of season three, which is known as Fear Itself, when the show moved to NBC. Hmm. Was there an episode with an ice cream man, like an evil ice cream man? Because I think I might have seen that. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't quite recall. Well, there was a movie with an evil ice cream man, wasn't it Clint Howard? Maybe that's what I saw. <laughs> Who knows? Oh my. <laughs> So anyways, Melissa. Well, let me go back to 1999, okay? So in 1999, I started helping run this convention called Convergence, which is based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I wasn't heavily involved at this point, but I was like showrunner adjacent at this point. And the people who were running the convention started working on getting their guests in for the first year. And who did they want to be their inaugural guests? And one of the first people who signed on was the immortal Fori Ackerman. Mm. And that was lovely. I've met him. Yeah. Yeah. He's a oh, rest in peace. Yeah. Or maybe not rest in peace being Fori Ackerman. Rest in collectible. Yes. Rest in collectibles. And one of the other people who signed on right away was a gentleman named Harry Knowles. Harry was just kind of a fixture of the convention. And boy, God, you know, you put that man in a room and he will not shut up. He will have stories and he will da 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 And he was great. He was a great guest because I don't think he ever slept. He'd just talk over, like, there'd be panels lined up in a room, but no, he'd just keep talking. But he had great stories, so they just kind of let him ramble on. And so Harry kept coming back to the convention, and around 2002, 2003, I was more heavily involved in the convention, and in fact, I was mm, dating one of the guys who was on the board, and so I started getting invited to the Buttonumathon, which is mm. a 24-hour film festival in Austin, Texas, which is basically Harry's birthday party every year. It's in December, 
It's one theater, like about 200 people. It's invite only. And Harry finds stuff and shows it to you. And it could be old. It could be new. It could be premieres. He smuggled out of the studio from under the nose of the executives. It could be anything. So around, mm, I want to say 2003, 2004, I was at Butnamathon. And Drew McWeeny shows up with this thing that he's working on with John Carpenter. And it happens to be cigarette burns. So nobody had heard about Masters of Horror, except for the people who were really working on it at that point in time. But uh, we had a copy of Cigarette Burns. And actually, Lucky McKee also showed up with his episode, which was Sick Girl, which is also a lot of fun in its own way. So at Buttonumathon that year, we watched both Sick Girl and Cigarette Burns back to back. So I think I was in the first audience to actually see Fin Absolute du Mont. <laughs> <laughs> And you survived. So that is part of my history with Masters of Horror. The other one involves Mick Garris at New York Comic Con. We should probably mention Masters of Horror was created by Mick Garris, mm -hmm. who is the director of films and television such as Critters 2, Psycho 4, Sleepwalkers, The Stand, The Shining, Riding the Bullet, and Desperation. Hmm. As in The Shining that is not directed by Kubrick. Right, mm -hmm. it's the Stephen King approved version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Starring the guy from Wings. Which I think you could still cut into a good two hour movie. Unfortunately, it's six. <laughs> Oh, Mick, you're such a nice guy, but oh. I love Mick, but yeah, he's such a ham fisted director. Yeah, he's a better historian and producer and interviewer. Great writer, though, I will say. Good writer, good writer, but mm, eh, directing, yeah, not so much. But I do like him for creating Masters of Horror because yes. I think Masters of Horror as a project was wonderful. The first season, the whole thing was they have a TV crew that worked on each episode. But the creator could come in and it was no holds barred. There were no rules. They could do pretty much whatever they wanted. And so the first season mostly was fairly solid. I mean, of course, there's variability because everybody's coming in with a completely different idea of what they want to do in this sandbox. But you got great things like cigarette burns and I liked Sick Girl. John Landis came back and it's like, oh my God, John Landis, who knew? He's still alive. Don Coscarelli. Coscarelli. Stuart Gordon. Stuart Gordon was having a lot of fun. Toby Hooper. Yeah. And oh, Joe Dante's episode is probably my favorite out of that first series. And then second series wasn't quite as strong because that's when Showtime got involved and started laying some ground rules like no children can enact violence on other children. Well, I think that's because there was the infamous Takashi Miike episode of season one, which didn't air. Yeah. Miike tends to do that to executives. So they started laying ground rules and kind of as a result, the second season wasn't as strong. And then third season is when it was retooled. Third season for itself, they went to network TV. So mm -hmm. they had a lot of censorship issues right up front. And they were kind of then bottom of the barrel in terms of masters of horror, like the guy who did Saw 2. Wee! <laughs> well, even second season, you started seeing some of that. It's like, eh, yeah. not quite as strong anymore. I remember there were some really good episodes in Fear Itself, but it wasn't like masters of horror. Mm -hmm. And I was always surprised they never got Wes. Yeah. It does seem strange. And then also what was interesting is Masters of Horror started as an annual dinner that Mick Garris would host between all the directors. Oh, I didn't know about that. That's cool. And they would just meet up like once a year at his place. And as they were having the dinners, just started throwing around the idea. What if we did like an old school Twilight Zone style anthology series? Basically, you all get to do like an hour long film. I think it's a great idea. I, yeah. I really love the entire concept of it. I know one of the problems is, despite the fact that they said the directors kind of kind of do whatever they wanted, with few exceptions, a lot of it was just scripts that they had in kind of a slush pile, and then the directors just got to choose from those scripts. Yeah. So it was kind of like what happened with Tales from the Crypt. Let's just write a bunch of script ideas, and then the directors will just pass them around. We should mention them. Drew McWeeny and Scott Shaw on the writers. Mm -hmm. Drew, of course, was a major figure at Ain't It Cool News, right? Yeah, he was one of the big guys. He's Moriarty. So if you were an Ain't It Cool News follower, Drew McWeeny is Moriarty. Drew McWeeny 
kind of has bounced back and forth between In a Cool News and Hit Fix, which I think is now kind of defunct-like. And now he has gone off from both of those sites and he's starting to do his own thing. He's writing books now and he actually has a really interesting podcast right now that he's doing with Scott Weinberg called 80s All Over, where mm. they're going through every single month of the 1980s and discussing all the movies that were released in that month. Oh, wow. Right. I thought you'd be impressed by that if you hadn't heard of it already. <laughs> well, because I had seen that he had a podcast, but I didn't know that that was the setup for it. Wow. Oh, it's really impressive. And I saw that him and Swan go back to like 1991 when they co-wrote Fart the movie. Yeah. And actually, I think they met in high school, I think. Okay. So they're all buds. I know they were teens when they met. Scott Swan, I don't think I've ever met him directly, but he's definitely been at various film events that I've been at. I know he started showing up at But Numathon a couple of years ago. And then I know that him and McQueenie, they co-wrote these two episodes and then one episode of Fear Itself, mm-hmm. but haven't done much else. And Swan has kind of since gone off on his own. He's written a number of horror short films and anthology shorts and wrote and directed a couple of feature films, Maskhead and Big Junior. I'm less familiar with his work, but we talk online every once in a while, and I like him as a person. But anyways, just to get into where John Carpenter was at the time, this was a period where Carpenter was in another massive slump. Oh, God, yeah. He hadn't made anything since Ghosts of Mars. It had been four years. Yeah. Ghosts of Mars had just been torn to shreds. He had a number of other film projects that funders all just instantly backed out of. He couldn't sell a script to save his life. He could not Mm -hmm. get anything put together. He hadn't officially announced it, but he had basically consented himself to retirement. Mm -hmm. This was the start of present-day John Carpenter before the albums came out, where mostly he would spend his days watching basketball on TV with his dad, who is still alive in his 90s. (laughs) Good genes. That's that's actually kind of (laughs) sweet. Yeah. Cigarette Burns was the first work he did in four years, and he not only welcomed the project, but he was actually excited by the idea of doing it TV show style on like a week-long shooting schedule, tight budget, working with a set crew, because that was kind of a nice reminder of when he did that back on Someone's Watching Me and Elvis, and he really enjoyed that experience back then. And as such, while it did reunite him with KMB, who were doing the creature effects for the entire series, none of Carpenter's regular collaborators worked with him on this episode. None of the cinematographers, none of the editors, all of those were the set crew that were pretty much working on every episode of Masters of Horror. Yep. With one exception, and that is his son, Cody Carpenter, who did the score. And it is a very nicely John Carpenter type score, which I think goes a long way to making it feel like a John Carpenter movie. Cody, who was 26 at this time, he had quietly been working his way up through the synth electronica scene and had served as an instrumentalist on the score to Ghost of Mars. He didn't compose anything, but he worked as one of the musicians. To this day, Cody puts out albums which can be found on Bandcamp under the name Ludrium. And he collaborates with his father on both the Lost Themes albums and the live touring shows that they do. (laughs) Cool. Otherwise, I don't have much else about the release date because typically I'd be like, well, here's all the other films that came out at that time, but this was on TV. Debuted on Showtime December 16th, 2005, and TV by the Numbers was bought by another company after that time, so they don't have any archives from that era. Film buff Kirby Sweetman is struggling to pull himself out of tough times. He's managed to shake a heroin addiction, but only after the suicide of his equally addicted girlfriend, Annie. And he managed to open his own revival movie theater, but only with money from Annie's father, who's increasingly threatening to collect on the debt. To pay the bills, he started a business on the side, tracking down rare film prints and memorabilia for wealthy collectors. One such collector is Bellinger, a sadistic billionaire looking to find Le Fin Absolu du Monde, which depicts a real angel being captured and having its wings cut off, and was supposedly destroyed after its debut screening led the audience to erupt into savage violence and people died. Bellinger knows the film exists because he has the still-living wingless angel chained in a display room who's been eternally bound to the work. Kirby's investigation leads him to meet Myers, a once-renowned film critic who spent decades in isolation writing thousands and thousands of pages of a review of the film after having been at the first screening. Henry, a media exec who was once a projectionist whose fingers were melted and fused when he physically tried to stop a revival screening of the film. Dalibor, an underground snuff director obsessed with how a film captures truth, who beheads a woman on camera as Kirby is forced to watch. And finally, Katya, the widow of the director, who hates the film but kept it safe because she still loves her husband, even as her neck bears the scar of a slash from when he tried to take her with him during his suicide. As he's drawn closer to the film, Kirby begins to see cigarette burns, the markers in a celluloid reel change, accompanying horrific visions of Annie's death. 
By the time he has his hands on the film and is turning it over to Bellinger, Kirby manages to turn away from his own desire to see the work as he drives away. But he's quickly called back as Bellinger's screening has resulted in his manservant slashing himself with a knife and putting out his own eyes, and Bellinger himself debuting his own film in the form of feeding his intestines through a film projector. Kirby wants out of this horror show, but Annie's father tracked him down for their final confrontation, and both are forced to watch as the film plays again. As both have visions of Annie, Kirby realizes they're the ones keeping her from being let go, so he kills her father, then himself. Freed by the manservant, the wingless angel gives passing thanks to the body of Kirby, as it's because of this film lover that the being is now reunited with the movie he was once bound to. So Alex, do you recommend Cigarette Burns? Oh, I feel like, I don't know, I'm walking out like Indiana Jones onto that invisible platform here because I don't know if you two like it. I don't. I (laughs) wanted to. I found that it did have a sense of urgency to it that a lot of later Carpenter films around the four-year mark before this came out did not have. And it definitely felt like he was invested, but I felt that it lacked a cohesive hook for a anthology horror Mm. because it's something I had seen before within the mouth of madness. And I didn't feel like it had a good ending. And I felt a lot of what was in between was very silly. And I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Melissa, do you recommend Cigarette Burns? I do, actually. I actually really enjoy Cigarette Burns. And part of that could be because the first time I saw it was actually in a theater, which was quite an experience. I think I agree with some of the criticisms where there's certain parts of it where, yeah, I can see the DNA of the script. Like, it's like, hmm, Drew, yeah, you were definitely taking the ring and mashing it together with Lovecraft and making it about a film instead of a book. And there are parts of the story that seem a little ham-fisted in there. But for a one-hour, half-length movie... I think it's pretty strong. It definitely makes good use of its time, that's for sure. Oh, goodness, it does. And there is a sense of not just urgency, I think, but also there's atmosphere in this that is really nicely done, I think. I mean, the whole gist of the thing is it's very Lovecraftian in that it's trying to hint at this larger, more horrible thing that you cannot see. It is impossible to show this thing to you directly, so it just must be hinted at, and therefore your imagination tries to fill in the gaps. And I think it's successful at that, and I really like the way it works. And yes, it's very much like In the Mouth of Madness in that way, but kind of without the playful quality that In the Mouth of Madness sometimes has. It's a very dark and serious look at this. There's not much levity in here at all. Yeah, and it was interesting even listening on the commentary where Carpenter actually openly talked about enjoying 8mm and how this was influenced by it. I thought 8mm this whole time. (laughs) I do recommend it. I do think it is one of the better things that Carpenter directed, especially in the last two decades of his career. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I do have issues... I think there are some structural issues with the story. I think there is some really great writing. There, I love a lot of the individual scenes. Yeah. I just yeah. have some issues structurally, and I don't think it sticks the ending. Yeah, I'll agree with that. There's parts of the climax that are fantastic, but there's mm-hmm. other parts that I think just don't work. But I think the cast is good. I think it looks great. I also don't see a whole lot of actual Carpenter in the actual, I mean, in the score, yes, but the actual filmmaking, but it's still very well directed. And I think, as with some of his other works, shows that he can do commercial for hire work very capably, Mm -hmm. even if it's not like built around his own stylistic sensibilities. But no, I I do still really enjoy it. And I think given how far downhill (laughs) things went in the last few films... Because, yeah, Mm -hmm. we had the three-part punch of Escape from L.A., Vampires, and Ghosts of Mars. (laughs) Yes, this is better than all of those things. Oh, believe me, when I was sitting in that theater going, oh, God, Carpenter, I I hope... I don't know if I want this. (laughs) And and it went well. It's like, oh... Oh, that's the Carpenter I remember. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it's not strongly Carpenter. It doesn't march out and say, Carpenter, like if you weren't told this was a John Carpenter entry into Masters of Horror, you might not know. Except for maybe the music would be a hint. But I think it's a fairly strongly directed piece, if not strongly stylistically Carpenter. Right. And to be fair, Carpenter himself had kind of been losing the style. Oh, yeah. Over those yeah. last few films. Alex. What is it about the hook that just didn't really pull you in? I just don't think it, for me, have a very strong thesis. Just from, like, the introduction of the willowy being and Norman Reedus being like, okay, cool, I want $200,000, I'd be like, I want a mill. 
at least for dealing with something that involves an angel with its wings cut off. I don't know. Maybe it was being too harsh. Maybe it was the time I saw it. Maybe it was a whole bunch of different factors. I didn't understand people's motivations. And I guess that can be explained by the film pulling people in. Mm -hmm. But it just didn't really grab me as to why he was so motivated to do this. I know he's a film lover, but he seemed very disinterested. Having seen the people that Drew hangs out with... (laughs) <laughs> I can, maybe I can see it a little bit more. <laughs> I think that's an, also another thing. I kept getting anxiety because I was a projectionist for years. And a lot of it, I was just like, ah, I remember <laughs> that, just cutting things together. And uh, <laughs> cigarette burns were always on the tails. You didn't really find them in there and chop them. Right. They were already kind of pre-chopped by the time I got these films. And the oh, one yeah. scene was offensive. When he gets the film canisters, I'm like, what is that movie, 20 minutes long? Because they're like the tiniest yeah. film canisters I've ever seen. It's only two reels, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not a very long movie. <laughs> there are two reels, which he didn't even assemble. He put them in both individually. Like, he had both the reels separately at the end. Mm-hmm. And that was what was interesting, because in the script, they specifically say that the director had made a bunch of shorts, but this was his first feature. Yeah, Yeah. because that's what kind of held me back. I'm like, they kind of dropped that. And also, you don't feed your intestines into the projector until the final reels, and that just drew me out of it. (laughs) (laughs) And how high do you have to set the light so that it projects through the intestines? That's true. You'd have a strong bulb for that one. Although, man, that is some well-made equipment that it kept feeding those intestines through. I mean, that's some serious equipment. That whole scene is actually one of my favorite bits of the climax because it's so Tales from the Crypt. Oh, yeah. It is very Tales from the Crypt. I I wish I didn't see it coming. I'm like, someone's getting their intestines fed through a film at one point. There's just too much projector. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But I mean, back to the story hook, the issue I have with the initial setup of the story is they give away the whole mystery of what's on the film when they introduce the angel in the first act. Mm -hmm. That's my problem. The angel should have come in at the ending. If they reveal that guy at the end, he's so striking. It would have been very effective. I mean, I think you know, instead of like Kirby leaving the house and then coming back, what if while the film is playing in the other room, he finds the angel and the angel tells him what happened to him in the making of the film. So we realize what the film is actually about as it's being screened in the other room. That's what I would have liked. So you don't even need to see any of the movie. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah, I think it blows the mystery. I, I love that you initially have just the two wings on the wall. That's great. But then you see the angel in the first 10 minutes. And he He's so nonplussed by it. That's what took me out of it. Yeah, because, I mean, that's like a huge supernatural leap. I would like to have seen it more where he is driven by the film obsession. Show him more invested in that because he's so wishy-washy and he's doing it for money. He's not doing it for money. Then the angel reveal at the end would have been great. I can't argue against that. The only thing I can think of why that would have been structured like that is because sometimes if you leave a reveal like that till too late, it doesn't sell just because like suddenly there's a supernatural element, but clearly there's supernatural elements coming in when he's starting to dream of the cigarette burns. If it were a slower build and it wasn't top loaded with the angel. But the thing is, something had to be up front in order to scare him off a little. And that's when he went, I don't really want to do this, but I'll bump it up to 200000 and that will get me out of hock with this girl's father. Mm-hmm. Well, but I think that's where they're, they're not trusting the mystique of the film itself. Yeah, it's very possible. They create this great backstory for the film, mm-hmm. and it's like initial screening and everything, but then they don't trust that to be enough to lure him in. But the thing is, you know, it's very clear, he wants to find it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there has to be something strong enough I mean, what do you do right away to almost make a person like that not want to find the movie? And I don't necessarily think it's a captive angel in shackles, (laughs) but... The oddly anatomied angel. Yeah. I will say, I do like the K&B makeup effects in this one. I've been a little hard on them in some of the others. Yeah, the angel itself is a striking visual. Like, when I first saw him, I was like, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. I like his tapering fingers, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, uh, Alex, what did you think of Norman Reedus? I don't want to be too negative, but I felt he underplayed it. And then I felt the father overplayed it, so there wasn't a balance to it. I think he did fine, but nothing too great. It was mostly a lot of, he's got that blue steel look that he's got, and he used that <laughs> to great effect, and he did fine. I like Norman Reedus in general. This was about at the time when everybody was realizing that Boondock Saints was a hell of a lot of fun, so. I've still never seen Boondock Saints. No. Put it on the list. Putting it on the list. (laughs) Put it on the list right now. 
But yeah, Norma Reedus I like. In this, I don't know. I like that he seems to be acting in a movie without supernatural elements. I mm-hmm. like that. He seems to be the grounded person in the center mm-hmm. of this really spectacularly weird set of people. And he keeps getting sucked further and further in. I don't know if he's exactly the best person for the role. Like, I'm sure there, if given another 20 minutes, I could probably think of a couple other actors I think would be spectacular in that role. Can they be gotten on a TV budget? Yeah. That's your thing, yeah. I think he did a fine job with what he was given, and I'm not sure what he's doing now. Is he on Walking Walking Dead? Dead? He's been on Walking Dead for a long time. Okay. He's like one of the major stars. I've never watched it. I'm very bad at TV, so I've never seen an episode of Walking Dead. I remember when I first saw Cigarette Burns, I had never heard of Norman Reedus. I don't think I'd seen huh? him in anything. Oh, because you have never seen Boondock Saints. Right. He's in Blade 2. Oh, that's right. Oh. Then I've probably seen him in Blade 2, but I didn't remember. Yeah. Blade 2, I oddly forget. I don't remember anything about it except how it looks. Yeah. It looks great, but yeah, it's not really super memorable. I remember the first time I watched Cigarette Burns was right after I had seen the horror movie with Edward Furlong, Brain Scan. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Which I love as a movie, except for the fact that it stars Edward Furlong. And Norman Reedus just kind of resembles Edward Furlong enough that I got annoyed with him quickly. (laughs) Unfairly so. But now that I have actually, I haven't watched all of it, but I saw the first couple seasons of Walking Dead, was really impressed with Norman Reedus in that. Now that I kind of have more context for him as his own actor, originally he was just kind of scuzzy and just didn't really trust him as a character. But now I can really see a lot of the nuance to his performance. Mm -hmm. And again, he's a character who's coming out of heroin addiction and all that stuff. So he was nice as a play on that hard-boiled detective. But I think one of the problems, and this is a problem that they tried to address, is you never really get to see his love of film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because they show the uh, projectionist and it shows his love of film more than it does with Rita's. And part of that is you actually did see the collections that he and the Udo Kier character had But the day of the shooting, they realized we didn't clear any of this. Uh, And they had to completely strip the sets down. uh I see. So there were supposed to be scenes where they're immersed in their respective loves of film, but then they had to just strip it out because of legal reasons. Right. That would have been interesting to see where they were actually planning to go there. And yeah, I know one of the issues is that when we get to the revival theater that he has, you see the title of the Argento film, but the only poster you see is of some crappy direct-to-video Miramax Dimension film from the early 2000s, because <laughs> that's all yeah. they could clear. Which is unfortunate. But yeah, you get that thing about the guy who clips out cigarette burns, but it's not him, it's the other character. You hear about all these other people talk about film, but you never mm-hmm. really get his actual perspective on it. Why is it that he loves it so much? Why did it drive him? Why does it continue to fuel him through all the tragedy he's been through? Mm -hmm. Why does this theater mean so much to him? And why did his girlfriend, why was she so involved in it? You get the sense it's not just because of her, you know, he's always had this love of film, but she either got pulled into it or she was already a film lover too, and Mm -hmm. you don't get that connection. You don't get any real context for the girlfriend, except that she's dead now. She was once on heroin. And is often naked. And was often naked. (laughs) <laughs> I felt really bad for her. I'm just like, oh, poor that poor woman. nude woman. She's done so many scenes and then her red butt at the end. And I'm just like, oh, I hope they paid you well. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, she actually really enjoyed it and actually did a lot more than they initially asked her to. Oh, they, they found a nudist. <laughs> yes. More power to her. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah, yeah, I got to that bit of the Drew McQueenie commentary where he was visiting the set that day and was a bit surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Well then, lady, let your freak flag fly. Absolutely. To a degree, I think this story has more depth to it than In the Mouth of Madness did, because I love In the Mouth of Madness. It has the scale and that Lovecraftian thing, but it has a lot of ideas that it never really explores or even talks about. It's like it presents you with a lot of ideas, but it never gets into any of them. Mm -hmm. Right. This one actually does have a lot of conversations about the power of film, the truth of film, and all that stuff that while it doesn't fully mean anything, it's at least trying to get a little deeper into it. I do agree with that. They talked about all the different aspects, including film reviews and stuff like that. I did appreciate that. And the collectors and seeing like how people tracking down prints and whatnot. Yeah. It would have been great at the end of this, though. They were just like, oh, it's on Netflix. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the thing is, he's kind of carrying us through these various perspectives of films. But again, we never get to hear his own. Yeah. Right. I mean, I almost think that would have been a nice coda for the ending of the film is to actually hear it. Yeah. And then before we get into the main plot, let's just talk about the father there, Gary Hetherington as Walter. I think the biggest mistake this episode makes is you did not need to bring him into the third act period. You could have just had him be the motivation for the character at the beginning. He did not need to be involved in the ending of this film at all. Right. I agree. I thought the moment he shows up in the climax, everything just kind of sidetracks. And then it's weird that the ultimate theme of the film, the coda, becomes we can't let this dead person go unless we let ourselves go. And it's like, no, the actual coda should be actually something about the film. It's like they forget about the film and just make it about them. Yeah. I get that as an emotional arc, but... Well, I think there are so many different threads that are all parallel because I think what they were trying for, at least, was that the underlying theme about everything that's going on is addiction. Because you've got the Mm. heroin addiction, you've got this memory of a person who's gone now that doesn't go away and they can't give up. You have this film that you can't give up on. It keeps drawing you in. And so all these things are converging upon this one point. So I think that's at least what they were going for in the writing. That sounds right, but I didn't see that. Whether it sells or not is a different thing entirely. I would have rather left Kirby on an ambiguous note, kind of like the Sam Neill character at the end of In the Mouth of Madness, rather than just have him kill the dad and kill himself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see a bunch of mayhem, and then someone finds the room with the angel, the big reveal, then end. I wanted to see an actual scene between him and the angel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're in each other's presence a few times, but they never interact. Well, it feels like he doesn't get a hero moment. I mean, he gets a conclusion to his own storyline, but he doesn't get a hero moment. I don't necessarily need all my main characters to be heroes. Right. But if his final move was giving the film to the angel, like finding the angel first and then seeing that this is what I need to do, the conclusion of my love of film is going to be getting this film the hell out of existence and handing it off. That may have been a more satisfying ending. Right. I mean, like if while the film is playing, he's learning from the angel what happened to the angel and we hear from the angel how film can steal how film Mm -hmm. can take and how film can like capture you and all that stuff like further the philosophies and then go from that to the horror of what's happened to Udo Kier and his manservant all that to him giving the film to the angel and setting the angel free I think that Mm -hmm. just would have culminated the arcs better I agree with that although I mean there's a certain direness to everybody just gets eaten by their own personal flaws. I know, but his just felt more like forced plotting than actually a natural conclusion to the story. I agree with that, but I mean, there's something very dark about letting all the characters basically eat themselves. But at least the Norman Reedus character has gotten the film to the point where the angel can take it back. I don't know. I just, I actually kind of would have liked the more poignant thing of he spends all this time searching for the film and he never watches it in the end. And it seems weird that it's the manservant who brings the key to the angel. I mean, it doesn't because, I mean, this guy would have seen this poor thing shackled up in the living room for however many years. Well, back when he was able to see. Yeah, back when he was able to see. And yeah, that does make sense for that character when you think about it. But he has such a tangential relationship to the movie we are watching that it feels like, you know, maybe he could have collaborated with Kirby. Though I gotta say, how great was that, him putting his eyes out shut? Oh God, yes. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You brought the film here, and you must suffer the consequences. And he pulls it out and goes into the other one. (laughs) (laughs) And he's laughing. Yeah. Let's jump around to some of the other characters now. Let's go ahead. Alex, what do you think of Udo Kier as Bellinger? I can't say anything bad about Udo Kier. He's a special effect unto himself. He just <laughs> has to stand up and regard you, and he's great. If you say something bad about Udo Kier, he might show up and change your mind. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and he'll both charm you and horrify you at the same time. It's true. I adore Udo Kier so much. Not just in this. I just generally love all things Udo Kier. <laughs> I've even seen the Warhol Dracula and Frankenstein's and he was Oh God, yeah. He's such a unique actor. When I think back on Udo Kier, there's a lot of movies that he was bad in, but the more I watch of him, the more I realize it's just because they didn't know how to use him. Yeah. No, it's true. They use him so well in this. Oh yeah. He's like a silent film actor born out of time. Mm. He's just so expressive. He's like Peter Lorre of the modern day. Yeah, yeah, the light loves him. Oh, his eyes. His oh, eyes. Oh, goodness. They come alive, yeah. His eyes, that accent. 
And it's the intensity. Yes. To use Udo Kier, you have to have him in a role that just uses that intensity very well. Mm-hmm. And this is all about that drive and addiction and intensity and focus. And so it's perfect here. The whole projector scene, Mm -hmm. even before you know what's going on, just the noises and the reactions that he's making, you just know he's doing something horrible to himself. And it's like, oh, 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 oh." so here's a postulation for you. Mm -hmm. How interesting would it have been to see Norman Reedus and Uta Kier swapped in their roles in the story? Like Norman Uh. Reedus was like a young playboy who was obsessed with film and just really wants to see this thing and is willing to pay a lot of money for it. And Udo Kier's the old expert at this who goes after it. That would solve all my problems. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know that Norman Reedus would have sold as well the moment where you reveal the angel and he just pulls out an ice cube and throws it. That's true. Uh, I don't know. Udo Kier would have sold the intensity of the obsession a lot better. Oh, yeah. You'd have to redo the backstory tragedy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think, I think... It would be interesting. It would be very interesting. I almost worry, though, because Norman Reedus, he's got that kind of understated that you need in a character who is kind of bringing us from point to point. Mm -hmm. I think Udo would steal the camera every time you're on him, and then you wouldn't focus enough on the other characters. I agree with that. Reedus is a good everyman. Udo Kier as the shirtless snuff film director. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) The film shows us the truth. (laughs) Okay, how about Udo Kier? Here is every other character in this film, including the girlfriend. Udo Kier is the angel. <laughs> yes, Udo okay Kier is everybody. <laughs> While the look of the angel is interesting, I would still love to just have like a classic John Philip Law style angel. Mm-hmm. And Udo Kier as like now the aged, decrepit version of that. Yeah. That's been locked up in a house all this time. Yeah. Would be interesting. Udo Kier is great. I mean, there's not much to the character. You know, he's the rich guy who wants it all. I kind of love the whole thing of like, I have no illusions that I'm going to hell, but I just want a taste of heaven before I go there. Mm -hmm. I think he's perfect as the antagonist who also incites the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, it would have been nice to have kind of more his broader film collection, but I know there were reasons why they couldn't get there. I don't think it was entirely necessary, at least for his collection. No, he sold it just fine. Yeah, he sold it just fine. And the stuff that they had in the house just for the brief moments that you saw it, I think, sold the scene perfectly. I think the character that really got short shrifted on that was Norman Reedus's character. Right. Not Udo's. We know he has the theater. We know he's a film buff. We, we never get that bond of film as life. Right. On the other hand, we get Douglas Arthur as Dalibor, the snuff film director. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I think that works. Yeah, I remember watching this the first time and being like, oh, he just cut her head off. Mm-hmm. And weirdly enough, that's a nasty turn. And then he manages to up the ante even after that, which is really impressive. The grinding lap dance. Oh, mm. yeah. That just gets personal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and again, I think that sequence, you know, it's like, yeah, it's gory, it's horror and all that stuff, but actually does get into philosophies of film about it's like yeah. it shows the truth, it captures the truth. And Kirby's saying like, dude, it's just fucking murder. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he's still just going on and on about all this stuff. But what's weird, though, is it ends with another cigarette berm and then apparently Norman Reedus just killed everyone. Yeah, I found that very hard to figure out what was actually going on because it's too inconsistent. (laughs) You know what it reminds me of? If you remember the original release of Grindhouse... I was going to say, it's Death Proof. Yeah, it's both Death Proof and Planet Terror. Actually, especially Planet Terror because that scene missing thing where it's like clip scene missing, suddenly the team is all together and assembled. It skips past all the things that Robert Rodriguez is terrible at, (laughs) and it just gets to the stuff you want to see. I feel like that was the same sort of cheat. Scene missing, there's a cigarette burn, and then all things are chaos. Yeah, I figured that's what it was. It just wasn't as clear as I would have preferred it. But yeah, I figured that's what they were going for. Oh, absolutely. If they had more time and a little more ambition, they could have really played on the metaphysics of the film itself. Oh, yeah. Like have this reality is actually starting to function like a film in a projector. You know, as the film goes on, it goes from being clean to starting to become grittier film stock. There start to become errors in the film that we're watching that the characters are actually starting to notice themselves in their reality Mm -hmm. like the film jumps and the character like what the hell just happened Mm -hmm. i think if they had more time they could have really built on that angle more yeah but i think 
think you only have so much right. space in something that's under an hour. Very few people could pull that off, and Gore Verbinski was not directing this. Right. <laughs> My other main issue is once we actually see our glimpses of the film, okay, yeah, it's just your typical, let's just do weird flashy images, but most of it is of a woman in barbed wire clawing at a wall. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd think it would be more focused on the actual capturing of an angel and cutting its wings off. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, it's like a cradle of filth video. Eh, It's like, you guys saw the ring. We all saw the ring. Don't do the ring thing. We've seen the ring thing before. Right. I mean, like, let's go and do something more like, say, Sallow, where it's like a distant, stark, just a camera holding on and then suddenly it cuts somewhere else. Like, kind of do more like a cannibal holocaust or something like that, where it's just showing you this horrible thing happening. Mm-hmm. Just from a very stark, you can't escape it. Or you never see it at all. Or you never see it at all. Or even all you see are those stills, and that's all you ever see of the movie. It's the rule of Lovecraft. Never show the monster, because the monster is never as horrible as what your brain can come up with. Which Lovecraft would always show the monster, too, so that was always the problem. No, Lovecraft. not necessarily. And that's where I still think the angel telling the story of what happened to him as the film's playing in the other room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like, we know what the film is. What happens if you spill the blood of God mm-hmm. and it's captured on film? I, I actually really like that as a hook, that the film is, we caught an angel, we're going to cut its wings off. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And they could have gone a cheap route of, we killed an angel or we raped an angel. No, you cut its wings off. Mm-hmm. I like that. I just don't like how it's presented. I don't dislike it. It's just kind of let down by it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't show the monster. I mean, like the snuff director, I thought was an incredibly compelling scene. That's one of your great middle of the film twists where everything just suddenly takes a shift. Mm-hmm. He was the third strongest performance in the movie. I did like his Halle Berry Catwoman outfit, but uh, <laughs> at that point, I was just like, what are we doing here? <laughs> that's when it got a little silly. <laughs> what? But I mean, again, that's the point in 8mm where Peter Stamare shows up. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I like the wife, too. She was my top performance. Yeah, she is pretty fantastic in that role. She just seems fragile. Strong yet yeah. fragile, you know, that she's survived this long and she's been that close to the movie for this long. And here she is still living in an apartment with it. And she has so much hate and fear, but also love. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. she really loved her husband and this is a part of her husband and something he left behind. But it did such awful things to him and led him to such a horrible end. Mm -hmm. And she knows she has to keep it away from people who shouldn't have it. So she saddled herself with this. And, you know, once again, here's that story of this person being saddled with the weight of this past and for somebody that she lost to something horrible and a horrible addiction. And that was what was interesting because I did read the script by McQueenian's one where her character is a very different character. It's described as a very stark, sparse apartment where she's dressed all in black and androgynous in appearance, very severe. Mm Mm-hmm. There's this whole thing about how she kept the film, but she kept it in a way that she hoped would destroy it. Like she just kept the canisters up on a heater. Oh. In the commentary, McQueen and Swan talked about how they were originally going to have her keep it under the refrigerator because that's an actual Peter Bogdanovich story where he found a film under a refrigerator where that accidentally ended up preserving it. Wow. (laughs) Interesting. It's interesting how they just made her more normal and she's very lovely. It's a very sweet scene about all this horrible stuff that happened. It was a very different take on the character than what was on the page, and I actually really like it. Yeah, I think she's pretty much the most human person in the entire story. It helped ground things very well. Yeah, it really did. And I love that she's one of the two Duras sisters from Star Trek. Yes. (laughs) I even love the bit where she tells him all this stuff, and he still is like, is it okay if I watch the film? And it's like just that crush to her that she still expected. Yeah. She saw it coming, and yet she was hoping. And yet, to his credit, he didn't. He actually walked away from watching the film. Yeah. Until the other further climax happened where he was forced to. That's such an interesting character where I kind of like that he's kind of always wobbling. Will I watch it? Will I not? Will I watch it? Will I not? Mm -hmm. Because part of it is him telling people what they want to hear. Part of it is also dealing with him and himself. He really wants to see it but he doesn't know if he wants to see it. Right. As he's going along, he sees all the damage it has caused. And you can tell by that final scene, it's like, I'm out, man. Here's your movie. I'm gone. Which is really something. But like you said... Then the ending keeps going. (laughs) Yeah. Then the ending keeps going. Mm -hmm. And some of the other characters, it was Myers, the film critic, who I like that that plays the whole thing of like, 
that review I wrote was a lie. It didn't do justice to it. Here's the thousands of pages of the <laughs> actual truth. I think that's one of the creepiest images in this entire thing is that room full of paper. And to find out that it's all one review. It's all one review. That he's been writing for decades. <laughs> it's almost done. I'm hoping that it's not like The Shining, where it's like all just one sentence over and over again. It's I would actually want to think that he's actually been writing an expansive, say everything possible about this one. <laughs> A frame by frame discussion. <laughs> grain by grain. Yeah. For a two real 20 minute movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was Henry, the guy in France who had his hand fused. Mm hmm. I never quite got, what is he now? Is he like a media executive or something? I thought he was a distributor. Distributor? Okay. An exec of some sort. But I like that idea of he lost his hand trying to pull the film out of the projector when they were trying to do a second screening. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great Lovecraft scene. It must have been a projector made by the same company that pulled the intestines through. Mm -hmm. I think so. Just strong, strong machinery. That's really strong machinery. That's like Stephen King, the mangler sort of level film projector. Knowing Bellinger, <laughs> he has that projector in his house because it was the projector from the revival screening. Probably. There you go. Probably. Yeah. There's probably bits of that hand still in it. Because <laughs> if you clean it out, it loses value. <laughs> that hand is helping to feed that in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And again, the Cody Carpenter score I thought was good. The whole melodic theme is mm -hmm. very Goblin. Yeah. Even more so than John's ever done, but mm -hmm. not, absolutely not in a bad way. I really like it. Yeah. I like the score quite a bit. And yeah, a lot of the score is just nice atmosphere sets the scene. And that again, I think that's where you get the most Carpenter is the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I do think that music really does help set that. Yes, I agree. I mean, like in terms of the Carpenter direction, not feeling, I, I mean, if I had watched this film without a director credit, I would not have said this was John Carpenter. It's a very capably made film. I'm not necessarily saying this as a criticism, but it definitely showed that he could go outside his style and still function outside his style, mm -hmm. which we've seen time and again. I mean, I know Memoirs of Invisible Man wasn't a fantastic movie, but I still thought it was very capably made. Starman was a commercial for higher work that he did. Elvis, even as awful as that script was, was a very well-directed film. Body Bags had some great stuff in it. It surprises me still that in that era of the 2000s where so many of the big film directors of the 80s were turning to TV, like John Landis and Joe Dante, Rennie Harlan. Well, John Landis couldn't get any other work. John Badham went into TV, Rachel Talalay. All these people went into TV and Carpenter never did. He just kind of mm -hmm. like, I either make my films or I sit at home watching basketball with my dad. There's that stubbornness to John. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he showed, they give him an existing script, they give him a week to shoot it and a budget, and he still puts together a really solid episode. Mm -hmm. It would have been interesting to see where would John have gone had he done like what John Badham did and just go into TV. I like it because it's that nice window into what could have been had Carpenter kept going, had he been a little less precious about making everything his own. But I mean, I gotta say, what's interesting is comparing this to Carpenter's own anthology horror, Body Bags, where as good as this is, the gas station <laughs> is still, I think, an absolutely killer episode short by Carpenter, and it feels so Carpenter. I wish this had been as good as the gas station. It's not, but it's still good. Yeah. Oh, gas station. <laughs> That was the best of the Carpenter of the 90s. Yeah. Not the rest of Body Bags, but Gas Station. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to add, Alex? For some reason, I thought the angel was going to say, everyone's a critic as he walked in. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone was waka, dead. Waka. <laughs> yeah. Thumbs up to you. <laughs> I was also hoping that the movie would be something else other than the like found footage horror thing. I'm like, I wish they were all like watching Ong Bak or something. They're like, oh, it's so good. He kicks a guy in midair. I'm going to stab my eyes out. I'll never see anything that good. It, it was something other than something like black and white and supposedly horrific and very art school. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Just some other genre. Take those shots of like Norman Reedus covered in blood, coughing up blood, and he's like watching Good Burger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think they should have just held it right on Udo Kier's face as he lost it. I think that would have been pretty effective, too. Yeah. And then we could have wondered what it is. But you know what? It's, I don't know. These things, I can criticize them, but they're still way better than anything I could do, so. <laughs> or, 
<laughs> oh god, it would have been the right era too. The film could have been a rickroll. <laughs> That's true. It could have been. Never gonna give <laughs> you up. <laughs> Never <laughs> let you. you down. Actually, I would love to see Udo Kier on karaoke night. Oh yeah, yeah. that'd be pretty great. I bet he can sing really well. Yeah, I don't really have any other notes. I think one of my notes was next time they should just watch a Transformers movie. <laughs> 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 Might have been the same results, though. That's true. Yeah. I mean, the Transformers movies do kind of make me want to feed my intestines <laughs> into the projector. Especially once they get past the second hour. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And then it goes into some other weird plot. Although I don't think I have that many intestines to last through the third hour. <laughs> So anything else you want to add about cigarette burns, Melissa? Oh, it's the coming attractions of the soul, Noel. (laughs) (laughs) And don't smoke so close to the film, guys. Yeah, (laughs) really. Seriously, you guys, you'd think they'd know. (laughs) Have you not seen Inglorious Bastards? Actually, no, I haven't. (gasps) No. (laughs) No. Yeah. Anyways, cigarette burns. Cigarette burns. I still like it. It's a nice refresher to kind of remind us that Carpenter can still do, even if it's not like the most Carpenter-esque thing, he could still direct. He's still a really good director. Elvis was mm-hmm. not a very Carpenter-esque thing, but it was really well directed. I sure. Mm-hmm. I think Carpenter, even when he just does for hires, I wish people would just kind of bring him in for the, like these little kind of fun little low budget things. I wish he'd be up to doing them. Well, I think by now his health is not quite up to where he can do a whole lot. Apparently he's He's healthy. I mean, it's just, I know he has the problem with his eyes because he had the detached retinas. Yeah, which is a big problem for a film director. But he has kind of found ways around that. I mean, very large glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because he still does his concerts. He's apparently completely quit smoking and marijuana. Oh, wow. Oh, that's impressive. And again, he's got the genes of a dad who's still in his 90s and watches basketball with his son. So. Yeah, that's true. He could still be around for a while. It would be nice to just see him do stuff. Well, yeah, but, you know, at some points, people like to retire. (laughs) That's true. That's true. And, you know, it's great that he's kind of found this second life doing the music and doing the tours and doing the comics. And he doesn't have to go and do the stress of making a movie. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I feel like, you know, doing music is much more immediate. You know, you don't Mm -hmm. have to wrangle around a huge crew to make one piece that then gets distributed. And then you have to support for like six, eight months after you're done cutting it together because it's now out in theaters. With music, you know, if you're in a live band, you just go out in front of an audience with your friends and make music. And you see the footage of the live shows. It's nothing like big, elaborate or stressful. Just old John Carpenter in his big glasses, bopping his head, working the synthesizer. (laughs) His son working the band behind him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great that him and his son have been doing so much together, too. Yeah, that's fantastic. I can totally see... In my retirement, I will make music. I'll just go out and perform for people and it'll be fun. And, you know, it's not something I had to nurture for a year and a half until people see it. Right. But I mean, and then you got the flip side of the coin where, you know, after this, he then does the ward, which I still haven't seen. I'm still looking True. forward to it, but I know it didn't get a good reception. Mm-hmm. And then I, again, I'm going to be curious to see pro-life because I've never seen it. I look forward to discussing it with you. Yes. Which we will be doing for the next episode. Yes. Mm-hmm. Any final thoughts from anyone before we bring this to a close? I think we got it. Mick Garris is a very nice person. He is. He is. He was very nice to me at New York Comic Con. I met him at San Diego Comic Con, too, and Mm -hmm. it was very sweet. Very quiet. Very wonderful hair. He has great hair. Oh, my God, his hair is wonderful. Yes. Very flowing. Yes. Mm. He looks like if Michael Bay were calm. Yeah. (laughs) And it's kind of like, you know how a lot of men in the 80s were really on their A game for hair? Mm. It's like that carried forward. Yes. Yeah. Well, I love that John's never cut his hair short. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. It's just gotten thinner and thinner and thinner, but he's still got it long. And white. Yeah, he's like Hulk Hogan. (laughs) It's just that wisp holding on. (laughs) (sighs) I've never heard anyone say John Carpenter is just like Hulk Hogan. If you think about it. (laughs) <laughs> well, he doesn't have a house in Clearwater as far as I know. If they ever do a feud-style TV miniseries about John Carpenter making a movie, let's cast Hulk Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. This is going really far afield, guys. Just yeah. as long as he gets to do the music video for Big Trouble. Oh god. Little China, brother. <laughs> oh god. Thank you, and we're sorry for the <laughs> latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. Please join us next time when we will be discovering pro life.
Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I remember us just so tuning out because it was mm-hmm. just wouldn't stop. It just kept going and going. And then Dinobots are suddenly there. Yeah. Yeah. And when even Dinobots can't get me excited about something, there's something horribly wrong with that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Robot dinosaurs are here, and I don't care. There is something wrong. There is something broken. If Stanley Tucci had been riding a robot dinosaur. Oh, Stanley Tucci with a robot dinosaur. I would watch the shit out of that. A Stanley Tucci Grimlock road trip movie. Yeah, I'd watch that. Where Grimlock is played by Oliver Platt. <laughs> <laughs>